Welcome to Offwatch. The Ocean Race Europe is just a few weeks away, so we thought it'd be a good idea to talk to some of the runners and riders in both the VO65 and the Amoka class. We've got Johan Rachon, the skipper of Muripuri's Racing for the Planet, and Sebastian Joss, one of the crew members on board Corum Lepania in the Amoka. First of all, Johan. He's somebody that we've spoken to before on this series, and he's got an incredible story to tell. So if you haven't heard it before, I urge you to go and look at that previous interview. But in this, he gives us an update as to where the boat is at the moment, how he's gone about picking his crew, and what he's looking forward to getting back out on the water and on the racetrack. Enjoy. In the last season of Off Watch, we were lucky enough to talk to Johan Rashom, the new skipper for Muripuri's Racing for the Planet. And since then, they've achieved a lot. Crew selection and, of course, the Ocean Race Europe only a month away. We thought it was good to check back in with the team and the skipper and see what's new. Yo-Yo, thank you very much for um, talking to me. Um, first of all, I just want to find out what you've been doing because I don't know if you can tell by my voice, but the restrictions in the UK have started to ease. And so I've massively overcompensated. I've been on the water as much as I can. I've been screaming the enjoyment into the waves. I've been on ribs, been coaching. What about you guys? How much have you been able to do now back on the water, getting wet, you know, in the wind and the waves? Well, uh, it's been quite all right since the, the first lockdown, really. Um, we've been allowed, uh, you know, to sail pretty much all, all the time as professionals. Uh, of course, uh, not every event has been happening, as uh, you can imagine. Uh, mostly the Mokas with um, the Vendée Globe and uh, and the Figaro and a few uh, Class 40 events. But uh, otherwise, it's been all right. We're allowed to go out on the water. So I, I, I did spend a little bit of time uh, this winter and the past few weeks. Uh, so uh, it's been good. And when I last spoke to you, I was talked to you, and correct me if I've remembered this wrong, but you, ha you know, you hadn't got the final lineup. I, you know, maybe not for the full Ocean Race event, but certainly for the Ocean Race Europe, you were still trying a few people. You were kind of, you begun your trials, but then things have been sort of cut short. Where are you now in that process? Yeah, well, obviously, uh, since uh, the ocean race has been moved by one year and we kind of have this uh, really uh, in-between event, the Ocean Race Europe, which is going to be great this summer, uh, the rules have changed a little bit. So the game has changed a little bit for me as well. Um, there are no age restrictions for this new event. So I, I did want to keep the crew I started selecting, maybe as well thinking ahead, that if we keep on going to the ocean race, uh, it's a good idea to start, you know, getting some experience in. Uh, so I did, in the end, kind of, you know, manage to keep the same crew. We're, you know, fully staffed now uh, with a, you know, a great bunch of guys. Uh, I have uh, Nico Lindven, a, a quite experienced navigator on the ocean race now, and a very good friend since we've. Uh, we were young, uh, helping me out uh, on the navigation, and uh, as well Jack uh, Boutel, who was with Dong Feng. Uh, they're uh, an important part of the of the setup of this team. Well, yeah, it's interesting because I was looking at your roster before we were talking now, and it, it seemed like everyone that you've got for the Ocean Race Europe, apart from one, and I want to say, it, and I and I apologise if I get the pronunciation wrong, but. Um, Marina, I think her name is. It's um, Antonio Fontes's partner. Everybody there has 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 done the ocean race. You know, you've got like you say, Jack Patel, Nico Lundvin. You, you know, you've got um, Bernardo Freitas, Emily Nagel. You know, to mention some, it feels like quite a strong setup. Certainly, a bunch of people that know how to sail a sixty-five. Well, yeah, I hope it is. So they certainly know how to sail the 65 and they, they've been teaching me a lot because <laughs> I do come from a different background and I can tell you these boats are a bit of a different breed. Um, it's it's very loaded, very heavy everywhere. And of course, the organization of a of a 10-man crew is, is very different to what I'm used to. Uh, but they've been great. They've been uh, giving me the time to learn and I'm starting to get, you know, an eye for what I want to see in the team, you know, how I want to see it organized. So obviously I've been relying on them uh, a lot since the beginning. Um, as we were the first team to go shopping, we 
we did get a chance to get our hands on, if I can say, and it's not very polite, but uh, on um, a lot of the experienced sailors who are still under 30 for the next race. Um, so that's that's a luxury we've had, that's for sure. And uh, a few of them for the Ocean Race Europe um, don't meet the the age criteria for the Ocean Race in the end, but uh, they're highly motivated people. They're some of them have been involved in campaigns. Oliver Young on the bow, he, I don't think he's done the ocean race uh, in the leg or anything, but he's been involved with Dong Feng. And uh, he's been, uh, he was uh, helping me on the Figaro two years ago as well. So I, I'm starting to know him pretty well. Uh, we have Rob Bunce as well. He hasn't done um, the ocean race, but he's done the solitaire. I know him, very strong uh, trimmer. Uh, he knows a lot about the, you know, the organization of a team as well. And so it's a... Um, yeah, it's a good team. I feel really good about them. They're really strong. I feel like they, you know, they 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 own each a little place in the team, uh, which they they bring a lot of experience to and a lot of energy. And it's uh, it's really good. It's uh, it's a real pleasure to organize. And um, I certainly hope you know uh, we're uh, we're going to take this team uh, forward in the future. Talking about learning from good people, uh, Bruno Dubois. Uh, working with with you as well, and I was lucky enough to talk to him not that long ago. Fascinating character and a really interesting take on the professionalism of sport. What what's that relationship been like with you, and and how useful has it been? Yeah, I don't listen to him all that much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, it's been great because obviously he kind of knows how to run the show, so it does help. Uh, it's kind of the same with the crew, you know they. They've got so much experience at this that uh, they make it really easy for me. Uh, I still have to make some decisions. Huh? <laughs> Don't worry, but um, but they no no. There's so much knowledge that uh, they they you know they just have to explain to me how things are run, and that I kind of you know if I if I want to bring in my own way of doing things, I, I do it sometimes. But uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a real luxury. Uh, you can see we're quickly organized into a, a, a real team. Obviously, you know, we're going to put this to the test in racing because this is going to be the real, the real thing. You're always the, the king of the bay when you're by yourself. Um, but yeah, no, no, Bruno has been a, a great help with uh, Charles as well, the back in the background, uh, who I can call, uh, you know, discuss uh, a few things uh, pretty much all the time. So, um, no, I have some great expertise with me. Yeah, that's for sure. It's, it, I imagine a lot of people are quite jealous of you at the moment because, you, like you say, you were able to go shopping at the right time. You were able to pull in a, quite a few people. Um, and I wonder as well how much you've still had to figure out with the 65s because certainly two editions, the VO65, I think a lot of fans feel like it's been fully understood now you know it's done but of course there's some new sales as well you know with the a4 i see some pictures of you guys flying this new downwind spinnaker there's you know there, there's still some interesting ground ahead so what, what if without giving away too much where do you find yourself um thinking that there might be some interesting speed to discover in the ocean race europe in the proving ground with the 65s you know, it's it's always what we say with the one designs, you know, ah, we've been through it, we've done it. We've done, I don't know, 15 years of Figaro 2. I can tell you they, they never went as fast as the last year. Huh? Maybe on tiny details. It's always tiny details, you know. But it's it's there's always room for improvement. I have to say that uh, bringing in this uh, A4 Spinnaker has been more interesting for me, made it more interesting for me, because otherwise, you know, they do know it inside out those boats and you know everyone's got the numbers and they know where the sales perform etc but we do have this new sale so it, it does bring a bit of a of a of interest into uh, the the development of the boats so we've been trying to learn that we've been out a few days uh trying to first uh see how it goes up then how it goes down and then how do you put it back uh, into the bag um, it's made for some quite interesting discussions, um, and uh, and of course, uh, yeah, we're we're learning how to use it performance-wise. 
uh, when is it, you know, when it starts to be useful and, and when it doesn't, it's not always that easy. It depends on the C state and stuff. So you do need to get a lot of experience in basically what we're trying to do, uh, get as much as we can before we go to the start of the race. And I think with the ocean race Europe, you know, of course this will be racing conditions and we'll be, everybody will be pushing really hard. So it'll be really interesting in, in terms of the straight line performance data but compared to the legs that you're going to have around the world the ocean race europe is going to be a bit more sprinty i mean it's still offshore it's still multiple days but you know it's not the same beast as the full round the world race how are you setting up the team and the way it's going to function as a boat during the race are you approaching the two things differently um, you know, burning out your sailors for an entire leg because you kind of can on the Ocean Race Europe. What's your thoughts? Uh, I think that, I think so. I mean, uh, to me, it's closer to you know, uh, Tour Voile legs or Figaro legs. You know, uh, you've done it. We've done it. You can you can do one month flat out. You know, you finish on your knees, just your nerves holding the thing together, and then you just die the next week into a bed. And uh, and that's it. But you can do that because the, the event is over three weeks, one month. It's not over one year or nine months, you know, as the ocean race. So you do take it differently. Um, you can get people out of the watches and trimming and doing maneuvers a lot more. You will need to anyway because the longest leg might only be, you know, the longest section in the leg might only be like 12 hours or something. And you might be changing sails very often because we are near the coast or tidal areas, thermal breezes, you know, little, you know, headlands to go around. So I don't expect that we're going to be sleeping all that much, that's for sure. Um, so we are trying to organize it that way in, in the way that it is a sprint in between two cities and you do need to find a little bit of balance with the sleep, but, you know, you, you need to be on top of the performance the whole time for sure. I completely understand that that balance. I mean, you've cast my memory back to, yeah, when we did the tour, I lost like seven kilos of body weight and I don't have seven kilos of body weight to lose. That's so, because we didn't have money to eat uh, now. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely true. But my point was going to be push them hard, don't break them. Um, so let, let, let's talk then about that route because it, it, this feels like, as you're saying, you know, the 65 with a lot of those sailors, They've had a lot of information maybe to, to give you, as any good relationship goes. It goes both ways. But this course for the Ocean Race Europe kind of feels like your thing. You know, with the solitaire and everything, it just feels like something, feels like very well-trodden ground, headlands, coastal, you know, only thinking these kind of 15-minute chunks. Is there a part of the course that is exciting you in particular? Is there a part of the course that's kind of making you go, oh, I have no idea how to even approach that bit? You know, how does it look? Um, well, we, we we know the, the, the cities where we start and finish, but I do feel like they might be lengthened a little bit because we need to spend three, four days out to sea. Some of the legs might be a bit too short if we go straight line. So I don't exactly know where we're going. But I do like the first one for sure to Kashkai. I mean, all the, the, the northwest of Spain is amazing to sail around. I really hope we do get to get to go close to the shore. Um, but I've actually done this course before uh, quite close to shore because we had a tiny kind of Europe race on an Emoka in 2011, I think. And um, and I thought it was amazing. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's just so short, so intense. You've got to think about the wind bends, the tidal gates, the little things everywhere. And the thing is with the Med and all those headlands around Portugal, Spain, all the way into the Med, the weather changes in basically every bay, which is, you know, it's amazing. And it's, uh, yeah, it's something I really enjoy doing. It's, uh, yeah, close to my culture for sure. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, maybe even in the Med, you know, if we go around a few islands, on the way to Genoa, it sounds like fun to me. How are you thinking in terms of, um, you know, I, I think to like uh, the Olympian, the Olympians that I've been lucky enough to talk to and they talk about regattas and some of those regattas 
The results don't matter. We're just trying something out. We're going to experiment in this way. And then there's some regattas that they go, this is do or die. I've got to perform here. The, the Ocean Race Europe for you, is this a chance for your team to prove how much work you've put in and your performance is there to get your own confidence up? Or is there going to be a little bit of experimenting with different modes and different styles? It's, it, it's, a, it's a testing ground. <laughs> it's hard to cho choose between both. Uh, the program has started early, you know, everybody has been watching us. We've been, you know, putting videos and pictures. Um... Oh, you've been setting the pace. I mean, yeah. you know, do you know what I mean? I don't mean like on the water, but as in terms mm -hmm. of a program building, you know, everyone is looking at you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, I know that and everybody's going to be waiting for us. I know that. Um, uh, yes, I, we're gonna we're trying to set up the campaign that is able to win that race. That's for sure. That's all we're doing right now. The when we sit in Lorient, I want to be, you know, uh, on the boat saying, okay, we've done everything we could we could to uh, to get this team to perform. Now it's down to the race, and we know how racing is. It's really hard. Sometimes you learn things you thought you knew, and uh, it's uh, it's a tough lesson sometimes. But uh, so I, I want to stay, you know, humble. Uh, I've got um, we've got competitors who have got a huge amount of experience in the 65, in ocean racing, in crude racing. Uh, so I'm not ready to say, you know, uh, this is for us. Uh, they were going to win it. Of course, we always, as a competitive team, we are looking to uh, win an event, but you know, this is going to be a one tough battle and I don't expect that my competitors are going to give it to us that easily. Okay, last question then. You know, when we see the images of you guys at the start line and everything else, I know you've had phenomenal success in some of the sailing that you've done and you have earned the right to you know, stand shoulder to shoulder with any of the best sailors that are going to be lining up for the ocean race in terms of what you've done. But just on a personal level, I know that as you come off the start line, I know as you walk down the dock, I know as you go out to the to the course, you're going to look very calm and you're going to look very centered, you know, the skipper of the team. But internally, how good is it going to feel to actually get to, you know, this start line with this team, with this boat, with everything that your team, the country, the world's been through, you know, are you looking forward to that moment? Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, it's been basically a year and a half without racing. So first of all, I really can't wait to go back out racing. Plus with a, such a good fleet, you know, seven boats, we couldn't hope for, for more in the 65. It's absolutely great. I've got a team which I've been dreaming of. Uh, I would love to take this team, you know, around the world uh, as soon as I can. Uh, so I, I I can't wait to see what you know level we we are at, uh, you know, uh, against this fleet. So I, I'll be you know extremely proud to 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 walk down to the boat with this team with me um, for sure. Yeah, and, you know, it's it's one of my dreams, one of my objectives, and I I couldn't uh, you know hope for more right now. So I'm gonna make the best of it. That's for sure. All right. No favorites, but I wish you all the best, buddy. Good luck. All right. I'll be cheering you out there. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you now. Well, a big thank you to Johan for giving us his time and giving us an update as well as what we can look forward to seeing the VO65s back in action in a few weeks. Next up, it's Sebastian Joss. This is a crew member on board Kurum Imoka, and he's got quite an incredible story to tell, as well as a few things that we should all be looking out for when we see the Imokas sailing around this coastal course. Enjoy. Frenchman Sebastien Joss will be competing in the Ocean Race Europe in just a few weeks' time as part of the four-person crew on board Corum Le Pagne. Now, he's no stranger to the Ocean Race, having competed in 2005-06, skippering ABN AMRO 2, where they established a new 24-hour distance record, as well as being nominated for World Sailor of the Year. Outside of the ocean race, his passion and experience is pretty clear to see. He bought his first boat, a Figaro 2, at the age of 18 with prize money from his successes in sailing. And he's gone on to amass an incredible amount of a mocker experience, competing in the Vendée Globe three times. Uh, Sebastian, thank you very much uh, for joining me today. Hello. Uh, th let's start with the boat. Let's start with uh, Corum, because for most sailing fans, the last time that we saw this boat, 
it was in the Vendée 2020, um, where, you know, unfortunately, the boat uh, lost its rig. It had to sort of pull out a little early. Now we're going to be able to see it in this short coastal race for the Ocean Race Europe. And what have you thought about or what have you changed? Because obviously the big difference, apart from the course and apart from the fact that you're going down in the Southern Ocean when you do something like the Vendée Globe, but for the Ocean Race Europe, it's going to be multiple crew. You're going to be able to push the boat a little harder. Is it still set up in the same way or have you been able to modify it to take advantage of more crew? Uh, we modified the boat we, because when you start for the Vendée Globe, we have a lot of uh, spare parts. So you have free uh, autopilots and a lot of ropes, uh, halyard, uh, sheets, uh, in double and uh, maybe more sometime. For the Europe Tour, we, we managed to have a boat lighter, simple, because we are four people on board and, uh, and we, 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 we make the sail a little bit more thin, uh, smooth, uh, uh, flat, and uh, to, to, to make sure it is more performance because you, we, you, you can have a helmsman and a trimmer in the back of the sheet. So that is the big difference. And also inside, we managed to have two beds uh, all the time. And uh, for the Vendée Globe, you had just one. So, so and also uh, cups and a spoon and everything to, to make sure we can have two people on deck and two people inside uh, have a rest. And how does the weight come out? Because, you know, you mentioned the spares that you don't have to take because it's not the Vendée Globe. But obviously you have four people, you have the food, you have the water, but of course it's only going to be a few days. Is the weight the same or is it now going to be a much lighter boat? We don't, I don't know really. I think it's a little bit lighter because uh, we don't bring any, any water and, uh, and we don't bring so much food. For, during the Vendée Globe, you, you, you make... You can take some dry food, but also a long conservation food, so it's heavier. For a race of four days, you can make just a dry food uh, every day, and we don't eat so much uh, because you are full on on the deck. So I think the boat is a little bit lighter because it starts to be quick, and you start to take off some autopilot, some um, satellite uh, antenna, some ropes, and uh, every, even the toolbox. It's maybe too really small for the for this race and for the Vendée Globe. You have a lot of uh, tools. You have uh, uh, compos composite uh, resin, every, everything, so uh, layers, so all this stuff. It's off the boat, so I think the boat is a little bit lighter. And what about the way that you guys are going to be sailing the boat? I mean, how do you um, see? you know, the the difference. You're going to have the possibility of having a, a human helm all the time on the rudder or is it going to be something with an autopilot? I mean, what, you know, it's such an exciting possibility to see how, yeah, the Amokas are going to be able to perform with four people. How have you got kind of got ready for that? Uh, the, Imo, the Imoka with foil is a little bit crazy sometimes. So the autopilots, he... Um, my point of view, go faster because it goes straight, and uh, especially in Corum, you don't you don't have a vision for on the bow. So, so when you start to foil uh, over 25 knots, I think the autopilot is better, and you are just to to trim the the heel of the boat to make sure it's all all the time on the foil, and you have the the good balance. Uh, when it's light, uh, really light wind, maybe in Mediterranean or Gibraltar, uh, for sure you, you need a helmsman because you, you, you go faster with the helmsman. But it's two modes. It's one mode. When you don't foil, helmsman is faster. When you start to foil, it's maybe better to, to trim the balance. Well, let's talk then about the potential people that you're going to have helming the boat and, and sort of sailing the boat um, uh, with you. I mean, there's there's a lot of um, names that I think fans of the Amoka 
will be, will obviously know, you know, Nicholas Drussel, you know, obviously, you know, double solitaire de Figaro winner and, you know, the the, the normal person that we see with, with Coram. Um, talk to me about Mary Rue coming on board, because this is somebody who I think is... Um, not in any way to diminish the skills that she will be able to have on the Amoka, but she's not known for that. She's, you know, a dinghy, Olympian, uh, much more sort of one design sailing. Uh, what's it been like sailing with her? But we think about Marie because she, she has a, a CV. It's, it's crazy. She's many time world champion in uh, NACRA 17. She, she does the Volvo Ocean race. She wins the Volvo Ocean race with Don Fain. So we, she do a lot of one design, but she has a crazy, crazy feeling. So a flying boat or a dinghy boat or donkey boat. <laughs> She's not for the, for, it's a, uh, you, she, she know to, to push really hard the boat, but she know how slow fly, uh, really soft, uh, nicely, uh, in the small catamaran. So. So she can uh, help us uh, a lot because she, she, she has a really, she, she really good feeling about that. And I, I has both. When the boat don't fly, it's like a VOR 65. And when the boat flies, it's like a multi hull So, so she, I, I know she can, she can do, do it. And let's talk about you then. Because as I said at the beginning, you are a name that um, everybody will know who's been a fan of the ocean race for many years with 2005, six, um, Adrian Amro too. Um, it's, it's a notable campaign for many reasons, obviously some incredible successes, but with some tragedy as well. Um, but it's been a while since we've seen you in the ocean race. Has that just been from choice? A different style of racing was what what you wanted to be, or just circumstance. Um, why has there been this this gap? Uh, why? Because I have a lot of uh, other projects. Uh, I was in Gitana team for during uh, eight years, and uh, I manage a second, a third campaign Vendée Globe. Uh, and after we, well, first we start in mode seventy. After the, the class uh, die, so we, we do we do the Vendée Globe Challenge with the Gitana 16, and after we build the uh, uh, Ultim Trimarant flying boat. So I have a lot of uh, work with this team, and uh, and that's it. There is no time for any other uh, race. But the, I like the Volvo Ocean race. Huh? It's a crazy race. Uh, it's long race, fully crew. Even now with the Imoka 60, it can be really tough. So uh, maybe one day I come back in the, maybe the next one. <laughs> but uh, it's a really good remember. Uh, even if uh, some, sometime it was not so, so, uh, so good for, for the team. Uh, we, uh, we, we spend, I spend, uh, I think we spend a good time with the crew uh, during this race. And what about as a skipper? It, because obviously that experience, like we say, um, the performance was really strong with the boat. Um, you know, obviously with Hans Horowitz on leg seven, I think it was, you know, the tragedy there um, was obviously something that would have been testing to anybody. Um, but your experience as a skipper, I always feel, must be very different from the experience of the rest of the crew. Is being a skipper something that you think, oh, yeah, you know, it was really good? Or are you happier being like you are now, you know, somebody whose uh, experiences may be best in, in other areas? Oh, it, was, it was a dream to do the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh, I have uh, just 13 years old, uh, 30 years old. So I come back in, uh, in the Volvo in France. Volvo is really famous. And uh, we, are no, we are not so much uh, froggies to, to do the Volvo before. So when I... When uh, Anso, um, Roy Heiner called me and uh, asked me, do you want to do, uh, to do this, this race and to be the skipper? I said, yes. And uh, I see after what's, uh, what's happened. And I grew up a lot. For some time I was good. Sometimes I was bad in my decision. But uh, it was really uh, interesting to, to work with a lot of um, uh, nationality. We are six on board, nationality, uh, Kiwi, uh, 
English, Brazil, uh, Australian, so even uh, near Hollande, Netherlands, Netherlands. So all this, it was really, really good to, it was a good part of life. And it's interesting now, obviously, that we have the, um, with the VO70, Abraham Amaro 2, you know, the real powerhouse. Now, obviously, we've got the 65s. Um, the race has changed from what felt with the 70s is quite open. You, you, you know, you could do a, a fair amount. The 65s, obviously, very strictly one design. And now with the mockers as well, I wonder for you, I'm, I'm guessing you're more of a design uh, uh, you know, a little bit of more of an open class. W would that be right? Uh, we have to play with the game and the rule. Uh, when you have the rule one design, you play one design. Even uh, in France, we, we have Figaro, we have, we have a one mode 70, we have some class, is one design and he, the level is really high. And uh, it's another part of, the sp of this sport. After when the it, when the class it's open like uh, Volvo seventy or Imoca sixty, you can play a little bit more with uh, engineering. You can you can try a new ID. It's for that we see uh, foils today in in the Imoca, and we and we see the speed is incredible. But it's good for for both point of view. It's good for for design point of view and it's also good for the sailor sometimes to, to grow up and to see wow that is possible if you look at the last 20 years uh, we don't think any multi-hull can fly and any mono-hull can fly so now to go 30 knots with a mono-hull is normal and to go 45 knots with a multi-hull is normal also and it's safer the crazy thing is it's faster but it's safer because you you don't see uh, anymore uh, some monohull multi hood capside because the uh, boat fly really flat and it don't heal anymore. Is, is there a trade-off where, because where, as you say, we're flying, there's a little bit of a safety that comes with, with things like that, but is there a trade-off where things are also a little bit dangerous because the technology can be a little bit new? And we're still sort of developing it. I mean, how does it feel when you're out there on the foils? Does it feel that you can completely trust it? Or are you still thinking, ah, oh, you know, this is a bit new and so I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure? I think my point of view, we can trust the designer because uh he's born from from computer and laptop and you have to learn how to use how, how to use this new technology. But uh, is drawing to be stable, so we have to find the stability. And uh, since you find the good trim in the sail and the good trim in your uh, foils and rudders, you are stable. And since you are stable, you you can be one hundred percent confident, except if you broke of uh, broke the foils or if, if you hit something. But when you fly and if you find the good trim. My point of view, it's safer because uh, you can trust the stability when you fly. You mentioned designers and being able to tr trust the designers. We have to. Um, I believe it. you guys have been. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you guys have been working with uh, with One K One Kuniam Jan, who I was lucky enough to speak to uh, a number of months ago for this series, and he was talking about um, one of the things that really. I remember very clearly was he was talking about in any other sport, you would test, test, test before hmm. you then Race. used it around the world. Whereas in sailing, you go, okay, we're going to build it. And then off you go and you're testing it. With that in mind, every time you go on the water, it, whether it's practice, whether it's competition, it's a chance for testing. Is there anything that you are going to be testing in the ocean race Europe? What is what is a little bit new or a little bit of a, um, yeah, I mean, I, don't, I know that you might not want to go into details, but I just wonder whether there's anything that you might be trying a little bit new. I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Okay, wait. Well, then let's go to, let's talk about, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Well, let, let, let's see whether you can be open with this then. Let's talk about the Figaro. One of the things that's really striking me, uh, it, talking to a lot of sailors, is how different it seems to be growing up as a young sailor in France. And like I said in the introduction, from what I understand is correct, when you were 18 or 19, you, you, you just, I mean, I think you just finished second, I think in the Solitaire de Figaro, please correct me if I'm wrong, but then you bought your, your own, your, your own boat, uh, a Figaro two. When I was 18, I bought my first boat and it was not something as big and as expensive as a Figaro two. How is it that it seems like in France, there's a route to the, the top of yacht racing that isn't going through the Olympics. That seems to be the path for everybody else. In, in France, it, it just seems to be the stuff of dreams. You know, you're a young lad and you want to go and sail in the Solitaire de Figaro and, you know, there's a, there's a way to do it. How young were you when you decided, I'm going to do this? Ah, it's part of luck. But uh, in France, we are, we are lucky because in Brittany, it's a sailing valley. It's really strong. And uh, some uh, sponsors, uh, banks like uh, Credit Agricole, Credit Mutuel, help uh, young people to during a selection, uh, one week race uh, of uh, seven people, seven young sailors. Sailor. Uh, the first uh, win this week, win the budget for one year of s sailing uh, for the uh, French Championship in Figaro, and you can uh, be you can be part of the Finistère Course au Large uh, Center training of Singerin in Port La Forêt. So when you win this race for a young sailor, it's uh, under twenty five years, I think. The the first door it's open to 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 do your dream and to be to be good. In, uh, in the next race, in the, in the next uh, summer, in the first uh, Solitaire of Figaro. It's, it's like that you can start in France and you can start really young if your CV is good. And, and if you are good in, on the water, it's not about just CV. You have to prove you are a good sailor. So if you win the, this race, you open one or two years of sponsoring for, for do the French solo single French championship. And how different does it feel for you, having uh, gone through those uh, sailing adventures when you were young, and like you say, not with an awful lot of budget, you know, you can you can do it. How different is it sailing then to sailing uh, now? Do do you remember how different it was having to do things with absolutely no money? Whereas now, I mean, not that you have, you know infinite money, but you have a little bit of money that you can spend to develop foils and you can investigate things. It must be nice to have, to have sort of come from one to the other. Yeah, it's nice because when you sail, when you are young, you, as you say, you have no money. You, sometimes you, leak in, you, you sleep in your van, you have just bags. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's part of the sailing life. So after when you grow up, you you go in the bigger team and the Volvo was amazing for me for that because uh, the level of when uh, when you start to to learn sailing I'm a, for the Volvo it was that with Max Anderson and all the Kiwi and you you speak about sail with this guy and uh, uh, sail testing and uh, we I, I, I grew up really fast because we don't have all these things in France 20 years ago and now we start to, to, to work like that. So I learned, I learned a lot when I was in the Volvo when I was young and I, uh, I come back with this experience and with this background in France. Is it going to be nice also to be able to um, bring these boats? You know, I mean, the Amoka at the moment is that boat that everybody is talking about. And with the foils and sailing fans, you know, it's such an exciting boat. Is it going to be nice bringing these boats into the cities? Obviously, with COVID and everything, it's going to be a little bit different. We're not going to have people out 
on the harbour in the same way that we would do normally. But it must be quite nice to be able to show these boats to the sailing fans. Yeah, we we have some the the imoka the foiling imoka. It's, it's really incredible to see uh, because uh, the bow it's four meter high and uh, and uh, it's, it's not so much hull touch the water. So when you can see this boat uh, near your dinghy, it's uh, it's it's impressive. So I hope as many people or boat can come in the on the water to see the start or, or the finish because. You don't see so many times a boat like that on the front of your harbor, except in Lorient. <laughs> All right. Well, Sebastian, thank you very much. I know that you're a very busy, uh, busy guy. So thank you very much for, for talking to me today. And uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you on the start line. See you. Me too. Well, my thanks to Sebastian for taking the time for that interview and for Johan as well, as you heard previously in this episode. It's always a pleasure hearing from amazing sailors as well as knowing what it is that we've got to look forward to in the next couple of months when these teams, among with others, take on the Ocean Race Europe. I hope you'll be following that race. And of course, you can stick by with this podcast for more great interviews to come. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe for the updates and we'll see you next time. <laughs>